This is going to be Genesis chapter 31. And I'm going to call this ready to go home. And when I say that, I don't mean my earthly home. What gave me the thought about this title is the people that I work with. One of the first things a new trainee will say when he comes in is, I'm ready to go home. Of course, he means back to bed in his house. You know, sometimes I look at him and say, me too. But I'm not talking about the home that he's talking about. In this chapter, Jacob is ready to take his wives and his children and his goods. He's ready to go back home to Isaac and Rebekah. He's ready to go home. So I'm going to use this story to show how me and you are ready to go home. Home as in to be with the Lord. Number one. We're ready to go home because of this world's words. In Genesis 31, 1, it says, And he heard the words of Laban's sons. This is Jacob. He heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. So Jacob hears the words of Laban's sons. They are envious of Jacob, and now he has increased exceedingly, as it says in the last chapter. They're jealous of his accomplishments and his happiness. Uh, the world looks at you, and they hate the Christian. They see that you're happy. You have a car, a house, a good job, a hot wife, maybe, a, and they get envious of that. They see all these great things that you've got, and they're like, well, why can't I have all that stuff? Well, a Christian who lives right has godliness with contentment. It talks about in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. And Jacob did all his work. He earned his wives, his children, his goods. And all it amounted to was his neighbor envying him. In Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, Again, I considered all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. I'm ready to go home because of the words of the world all their envious words everything they say many times is just full of envy uh, you turn on the news and you see lies rumors cover-ups scripted deception god haters and as christians we hate to hear their words just like lot hated the words and the manner of life of the wicked people in sodom in second peter 2 7 and 8 it says, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. In seeing and hearing, he was vexed, it vexed his righteous soul. Just like the apostle John, we are sick of, of the words of worldly Christians. We all have our diatrophies in our life. And John talks about his diatrophies in 3 John 1, 9. I wrote unto the church, but diatrophies, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words you see i'm ready to go home because of the words of this world the only words that me and you probably want to hear is come up hither at the rapture i'm ready to go home because of the words of this world it's getting stranger and stranger more and more backwards more and more wicked more and more calling evil good and good evil putting bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter Darkness for light and light for darkness. Yeah, I'm ready to go home because of that. The next thing I'm ready to go home is because of the people's countenance of this world. In Genesis 31, 2, it says, And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. You might be ready to go home when your boss is your father-in-law. Jacob's supervisor and father-in-law was Laban. Laban's countenance had changed towards Jacob. It wasn't the same as it used to be. 
In Genesis 31, 3, it says, And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. So just like the Lord tells Jacob to get ready to get out of town, he tells us to get ready to get out of town. You see, you see because this world doesn't like you. It uses you. This world doesn't care about you. It's only pretend. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field and to his flock and said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it's not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. Jacob lets Rachel and Leah, both of which are Laban's daughters and both of which are Jacob's wives, he lets them know that things aren't like they used to be. Something has changed with Laban. His countenance has changed. And to him, this is a sign of the times. Now, I don't believe in looking for signs. I don't believe there are any signs for the rapture. But the face of the world's countenance has changed. It's looking more and more like it will look in the tribulation. And we know that when things are getting ready to wind up, that in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. You see, it ain't like it used to be. I've only been saved for about 11 years, and it ain't like it used to be when I first got saved. Look at the face of the world, and its countenance has changed. Men hate God more than ever before. Things are getting stranger and stranger more than ever before. I'm ready to go home because of the ca the countenance of this world, that the face of the world has changed just since I've been saved. If you've been saved 40, 50 years, uh, you probably got a lot more change than I did that you saw. The next thing is, I'm ready to go home because of the deception of this world. Not only has Jacob heard the words that are against him, he's seen the countenance of his own father-in-law is against him as well, and he is also aware of the deception. You see, there's a lot of deception going on in this world today. Jacob says to his wives, Rachel and Leah, who are also Laban's daughters, he says to them, And you know that with all my power I have served your father. Jacob was a good worker. With all his power, he served their father. In Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Jacob worked the job with his might. He didn't do it with eye service as a man pleaser. But yet Laban, his father-in-law, his supervisor, deceived him anyway. In Genesis 31.7, And your father hath deceived me, and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. The only reason he didn't lay a hand on Jacob is because God didn't allow it. The only reason you're in as good a shape as you are is because God didn't allow the world to hurt you. Verse 8. If he said thus, the speckled should be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straked shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straked. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. Now Jacob might be being a little deceitful himself. He's let the people around him rub off on him. In a sense, God did give the cattle to Jacob, but in Genesis 30, Jacob ended up with so much cattle because he deceived Laban. You see, Jacob is the supplanter. That's what his name means. He's a trickster. But I believe he is a better man than Laban. Laban is just deceitful all the way around. And that's why I'm ready to go home. That's why I'm sick of this world. The news deceived you. Your job deceived you. The music, movies, and TV shows deceive you. And people act like they care about your well-being, but it's really all about the money. Uh, they aren't concerned with how they can help you unless helping you makes them money. Think about all the deception going on right now, all the fakeness going on right now. I'm ready to go home because of that. The next thing is I'm ready to go home because the angel of God spake to me. Now, don't get scared now. I'll, I'll explain in a minute. In Genesis 31, 10 through 11, it says, And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived, that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped 
Upon the cattle were ring straked, speckled, and grizzled. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. You see, the angel of God is a appearance, a pre-appearance of Jesus Christ. In Galatians 4.14, Paul said, My temptation which was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Paul lets you know that the angel of God is Christ Jesus. And this angel of God makes plenty of appearances in the Old Testament. And this shows you that Jesus Christ didn't just begin in a manger one day. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. The angel of God is not just a regular angel. He is God himself, specifically a pre-appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the living word of God. He was the voice that walked through the garden in the cool of the day. And Jacob was ready to go home after he heard what the angel of God spake to him. You see, me and you are ready to go home after we heard what the angel of God said to us. And I don't need to hear... I don't need him to appear to me in my bedroom or in the shower or next to me in my passenger seat. I keep him with me in my pocket, in my lunchbox, in my hand, in my bookshelves, on my dining room table, my kitchen, and my bathrooms. He's with me inside of 66 books of the King James Bible. That's how he speaks to me, is through the Bible. He doesn't appear to me. He doesn't give me revelations that aren't even in the Bible. He talks to me through those 66 books. And he said some things that made me ready to go home. I'm ready to go home because the angel of God spake to me. In John 14, 2, in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. That makes us ready to go home. In Revelation 21, 4, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's just a couple of reasons why I'm looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jacob was ready to go home because of what the angel of God said to him. You're ready to go home because of what the angel of God said to you. Verse 12, And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see. All the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. Notice that Jacob is retelling Rachel and Leah what the angel of God said. It isn't the narrator telling what he said. It's simply the Holy Spirit recording word for word, what Jacob said. So this means we can take it with caution. We aren't sure that Jacob is being 100% truthful with everything he says, but we know that the Lord wants him to go back home. Verse 13, I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee from, thy, from this land, and return to the land of thy kindred, Remember back in chapter 28 when Jacob saw the ladder and he set up a pillar and called the place Bethel? Uh, that's what this is referring to. And the angel of God is simply telling him that he's the same God that met with him back there. And the same God who came into you when you got saved is the same one that will come again to you. He's not like your earthly father that causes you to be born and then just leaves you many times. Uh, God birthed you and he stays with you and shows up to you for all eternity. And another reason, though, that I'm ready to leave this world is because the world has nothing to offer. In verse 14, it says, And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? They're pretty much telling Jacob that they are fine with leaving because there isn't any portion or inheritance left in their father's house for them anyway. Possibly Laban was give, going to give it all to their brothers or just keep it for himself. It wouldn't surprise me if he did. But if you're a believer, then you need to realize there isn't any inheritance down here for you. If there is, it's just temporary. When you die, you can't take it with you. There is nothing here that should make you want to stay behind. Just like Rachel and Leah. There was nothing there that made them want to stay behind. In Matthew six nineteen and 20, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. You see, there wasn't any portion 
or inheritance left for Leah and Rachel. To them, there wasn't anything holding them back from going home with Jacob. And Jacob's home hasn't always been their home. You see, they just married into it. Now it's their home because it is his. Just like me and you, heaven didn't used to be my home, but I'm marrying into it. We are the bride of Christ and members in particular. And heaven is uh, so much now my home that I'm already there, in a sense. In Ephesians 2, 6, it says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm already home in Jesus. I'm just waiting on my body to be. You see, it wasn't always my home, but I married into it. We're marrying into it. Verse 15, are we not counted of him strangers? Now, he talking about, this is Rachel and Leah talking about Laban again. It says, are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us and hath quite devoured also our money. Rachel and Leah felt like they were strangers to Laban. They didn't even feel like his daughters. I remember when I felt at home doing what the devil wanted me to do. I remember when I could sit anywhere and do anything and feel right at home down here in this world. That's because I was a child of hell. I was a child of disobedience. I was a child of wrath, a child of the devil. I was of my father, the devil. But then I got saved, and now he's a stranger to me. And I'm in a strange land, even more so in 2022. So they say, are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us. You know, he sold them. They were sold to Jacob. Are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us and hath quite devoured also our money. Laban had devoured their money. What is the devil like? A roaring lion who walketh about seeking whom he may devour. What does he do in Revelation 12:4? He wants to devour the child as soon as it's born. Well, what do worldly Christians do? They bite and devour one another. You see, this world has nothing to offer. It just wants to devour you. It's only concerned with what you have to offer. Then it devours what you have to offer and throws you away. It devour, He devoured their money. You see, money, it's not an eternal thing. Proverbs 23, 5, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Now verse 16, Genesis 31, 16, For all the riches which God hath taken from our Father, that is ours, and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. So they are ready to follow Jacob home. Whatever riches has fallen into Jacob's lap, that used to be Laban's, is also theirs. So whatsoever God has said unto thee, do. That's what they're telling Jacob. They're in complete support of, of what he's about to do. One day the Lord is going to bind the strong man, which is the devil. He's going to take everything on this earth, and he's going to set it up. He's going to set up his kingdom, and we're going to reign with him. Anything the devil has on this planet that's worth having will be ours in the kingdom. So they say, for all the riches which God hath taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels. Now here, here's some things you need to do. You're ready to go home, right? If you're going to be ready to go home, you need to get your family ready. Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels. God gave children parents for a reason you need to train them up in the way they should go you need to make sure that they sure that as they get older that from a child they know the holy scriptures god set you as the spiritual leader in your home for a reason you see a pattern was set up in genesis 3 when eve ate off the tree the pattern is that the woman is easier deceived adam was not deceived but the woman being deceived was in the transgression but the problem is that most husbands are spiritual bums and they don't have as much Bible knowledge, don't have half as much Bible knowledge as their wife does. But the Bible calls her the weaker vessel. So what's that saying about you, men who don't know nothing about the Bible? Men need to do their part in getting their children and wife ready to go home.
usually that's all left up to the wife and the wife is struggling to to do the to take care of the spiritual needs and also the physical needs of the kids and the, the husband does absolutely nothing most times but jacob here he sets his sons and his wives upon camels he's getting them ready to go home most you see most men get home from work and they plop down on their camel uh, they don't worry about getting their wife and their kids up on there uh, they just plop down on the camel which now it's the recliner and it's left up to the mother to make sure the kids get taken care of and fed and everything else used to the husband would come home and watch gun smoke or something like a bum now he comes home and plays Fortnite or call of duty like a bum you know times change but really people don't change he has no care for god and he may love his kids a little bit but nowhere near as much as he loves himself Men really need to step their game up. Getting men interested in the Bible today is close to impossible. But remember, you need to get your family ready. If you're ready to go home, then get your family ready. And next, remember that you can't take anything with you. In Genesis 31, 18, talking about Jacob, it says, And he carried away all his cattle and all his goods which he had gotten. The, the cattle of his getting which he had gotten in Padan Aram, for to go to Isaac, his father, in the land of Canaan. So I bet Jacob would have had a heart attack if you told him that he couldn't take any of that stuff home with him. But you have to remember that Jacob is a picture of a worldly Christian. Although he has many things about him that you would admire, he's still a picture of a worldly Christian. He's so concerned about his goods, his material items, his stuff. You have to get to a place where you don't really care about your earthly possessions. I mean, you like them. You don't want them to happen to them. But when it comes right down to it, uh, it doesn't really matter to you. You have to get to a place where all that matters to you is what's waiting for you on the other side. And if you can get to that place in your mind, then you enter godliness with contentment. And Paul calls that great gain. The next thing you need to do is warn others of your coming departure. You're ready to go home. You're ready for the rapture. You know that it could happen at any moment. Now you need to warn others of your coming departure. In Genesis 31, 19 through 20, it says, And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's, and Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian, and that he told him not that he fled. Now I don't know 100% what would have happened uh, if uh, he, Jacob would have went ahead and told Laban that he was just packing up and leave, leaving. I'm, well, I know for certain that Laban would have tried to get him to stay. Uh, I don't know if he would have done it, made him stay by force. Possibly he would. But when it says Jacob stole away unawares, it doesn't mean he stole Laban's stuff. It means he stole away in the sense that he told him not that he fled. And, and it kind of defines that for you in verse 20, where it says, Jacob stole away unawares, and then it says, in that he told him not that he fled. So it's not that he's stealing his stuff. Now, Rachel did steal some stuff, but Jacob didn't steal anything that wasn't his. But thinking about you again, you know you're saved. You know the rapture is going to happen. But many of you aren't telling people about the lifeboat. You aren't telling people about your Noah's Ark. You aren't telling them about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, before your departure, you need to warn others. Don't steal away unawares. Now, maybe it was the best thing for Jacob to do that, but in your case, it's not. The rapture's already going to happen out of nowhere anyway, at any moment. So you could at least warn others what they need to do to be ready. You're ready. Hopefully, you got your family ready. Now you need to warn others that they need, they need to get ready. Verse 21, So he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river and set his face toward the Mount Gilead. So he fled with all that he had. Jacob is the kind of guy who didn't want to leave anything behind. I doubt he left a shoelace, a penny, a bubblegum wrapper, anything. He didn't want to leave anything that was his behind for Laban to have. Laban had already taken too much of what he what was his so he set his face toward the mount gilead he may not have had everything right but he knew where he was going he knew where he was setting his face and since you're going to be in your sinful flesh until the rapture you're not going to have everything right but at least at least you can know where you're going 
Verse 22, and it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. Now remember that there was that three days journey of space that was set between Jacob's cattle and Laban's cattle in the last chapter. So you see that gave Jacob at least a three day head start. So it was the third day when it was told Laban that Jacob was fled. You see, you need to get a good separation between you and the world as well. The Bible is infinite, infinite light years ahead of this world. And if you stay in the book, then you're going to have a lot bigger head start than even Jacob had. He had a three-day head start at least. But it says in verse 23, And he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days' journey. This is Laban. And they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. So it took Laban seven days' journey to catch Jacob. For one thing, Jacob already had a three-day head start. So I guess it took them three days to get back home to get everything ready to uh, go after Jacob and then three more days to catch up. So, or so, so many days to catch up. And he could have been traveling a, a lot faster than Jacob because he didn't have nowhere near as much stuff and people going with him. But... Adding all this up together, it took them around seven days to catch up. They could have been moving at a faster pace, like I said, because Jacob had so much stuff. But you see, when you're ready to go home, don't think anyone can stop you. Now, Jacob messes up. He thinks that he can be stopped. Jacob is kind of a scaredy cat in some ways. He's a picture of a worldly, faithless Christian. He's always thinking that man, that a man can stop him. But God took care of Jacob. In Genesis 31, 24, And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. See, God is taking care of Jacob by warning Laban in a dream, just like God, could, took, God took care of his father Abraham, his grandfather Abraham, by warning Abimelech in a dream. But then it says, Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilead. So Laban overtook Jacob because Jacob was so loaded down. Like I said, he probably was moving at a much faster pace because he didn't have as much on him. You see, when you get, old, when you get loaded down with the world's stuff, all your enemies are going to catch up to you and overtake you. If Jacob would have lightened his load and hadn't taken everything that he had, as the verse said earlier, he might have been a little bit faster. Laban never would have caught him. I mean, he had a three-day and better head start, taking all this stuff into consideration. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done, that thou hast stolen away unawares to me? Once again, when it says stolen away, it just means he took off without telling anybody. And it says, and carried my daughters as captives taken with the sword. Notice the deception of Laban. He's trying to put guilt on Jacob that he shouldn't have. Rachel and Leah are truly Laban's daughters, but he isn't mentioning the fact that he had already sold them to Jacob. And they're now his wives. They're no longer Laban's. Not only were they sold to Jacob, they were his wages. That's what he worked for for 14 years. Not only were they sold to Jacob, but he married them. And Laban has no right to claim them as his. They were not taken as captives with the sword. That's a lie. Because remember, they went willingly. They agreed wholeheartedly that they should leave. They went of their own free will. The next thing, the world will do what they can to keep your affection down here. Look what Laban's going to say in verse 27. Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly, and steal away from me? And didst not tell me, that I might have sent thee away with mirth, and with songs, and with tabret, and with harp? You see, the world will try to pull you back in with their music. Sometimes people will play things on the stereo at work, and then realize I'm in there, and they turn it off. They say, sorry about that, I, I didn't know you were in here, and you probably don't like that kind of music, or something like that. But they got it a little bit twisted. It's not that I don't like it. My flesh loves it. And most likely yours does too. 
there are some songs that aren't even good, and my flesh just likes it because of the nostalgia of it. Songs can pull you back in. It brings back memories. It almost, it's almost like it gives me a, a photographic memory of, of my life when I listen to that song. I'm like that with certain smells and, and songs and other things. The flesh just likes to rise up when it remembers something that gave it temporary joy. And that's all that, that this world has to offer is temporary joy. And it'll try to pull you back in. It'll try to keep your affection down here. But Laban goes on and says, And hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. People can make you feel bad try to make you feel bad for not being worldly. Uh, now Laban's acting as if he cares about his daughters and his grand grandkids. Don't you just love it when a, a deadbeat father only wants to have something to do with their kids when it's going to benefit them? So he's using some manipulation. He's trying to appeal to the emotion of the family to get them to come back or to stay. The, the world will appeal to your emotions to get you to stay worldly or to choose a worldly way like saying things like well love is love you can't help who you love so you shouldn't be against sodomy because then people can't help who they love you see they they try to use manipulation and and play with emotions to get you to choose a worldly way uh, you know, I bet the, the daughters, Rachel and Leah, desired the affection of Laban. But they never got it until it was time for them to go home. Until it was going to benefit him for him to give affection to him. He says in verse 29, It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. If it wasn't for God, this world would have overtaken us long ago. Laban would have overtaken Jacob long ago. But Laban couldn't touch Jacob. Just like the world has no power over my soul, because greater is, in me that, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, Jacob, uh, Laban couldn't overtake Jacob either. And remember that Rachel wanted to take her false gods with her. If you're trying to take the false gods with you, then that shows that your affection really was down here all along. Uh, Laban found out he was missing those gods that she had stolen. And it says in verse 30, And now, though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? You see, Jacob had no idea that Rachel took the gods. And there is a good chance that Jacob didn't even know she was into false gods. Sometimes your spouse can keep a secret from you and keep it very well. You can live with them and don't even know about it. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid. For I said, Peradventure thou wouldest take by force thy daughters from me. Which he probably would have, maybe. Or at least done what he's doing now and, and try to bribe them to stay. Play with their emotions to get them to stay. Play them a song to get them to stay. Well, that song would have gave some temporary joy, but... Then you would have been back into that deception and malicious words and, and things that the world does. It says in verse 32, With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Before our brethren discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. So right there you have it. The Bible itself tells you that Jacob had no idea that Rachel had stolen those gods. Jake and Jacob is confident that he has raised his family to be against idolatry. But he is mistaken. His wife is for idolatry. She stole the false gods. And Laban went into Jacob's tents, Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. Then went he out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. What would Laban find in your tent, in your home? Would he find some false gods to take back home with him in place of his? Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture, 
and set upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. Rachel had stored the images and the camel's furniture, the place where they would put like sat that saddles and stuff like that. And Laban searched all over her tent, but he found them not. So not only has Rachel deceived her husband, but she's also deceived her father. You see, you can fool and deceive everybody in your life, but somebody was looking down on this the whole time and knew all about it. The Lord, he saw all about it. He knew exactly what went on. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but he found not the images. You see, the custom of women was upon uh, Rachel, and it was pretty much saying it was that time of the month for Rachel. And they didn't have all the stuff women have now to take care of that. So out of respect, Laban didn't make her get up. You see, she, she dodged a bullet here. There's no telling what would have happened if he would have found those gods there. Notice that Laban searched all over for those false gods. And some people search for their false gods more than the saints search for God, more than you seek out the Lord. The most searched for stuff on Google is probably about celebrities and politics. I doubt there's much searching about the Bible or about the Lord. And even if you could search him, he's unsearchable. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out? But imagine if people search for God as much as Laban searched for his false gods. Uh, you've probably spent more time searching for the remote than you have the Bible. A lot of people spend more time searching for a lost remote or their lost keys than they do searching this book. And verse 36 says, And Jacob was wroth and chode with Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? The next thing you want to do is occupy until it's time to go. Now after seemingly, after this seemingly false accusation, to Jacob it's a false accusation because he didn't know that Rachel's tent, uh, Rachel's, <coughs> that in Rachel's tent was those false gods. So Jacob's now a little bit more bold, a little bit more confident because it looks like Laban just straight up falsely accused him here. He's like, see, Laban, what have I done that, that, that would make you come after me with this much rage? You see, he hotly pursued him, which is a common saying today, in hot pursuit. You see, the Bible's not out of date. Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren, that they may judge betwixt us both. So they are getting both sides involved to judge the matter. He said betwixt. That just means between. Now Jacob's going to explain how he's worked hard for Laban all this time. And this picture is how before you go home you need to be in the world and not of the world. Work hard in the world, but never let it work you. This twenty years have I been with thee, thy ewes and thy she-goats, have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. Jacob, although a deceiver himself, for the most part did an honest, hard day's work every day for Laban for the, over twenty years. And someone who is a hyper-deceiver like Jacob, I would say he had to work even harder not to deceive Laban every day and to do a true, honest day's work. Jacob is telling him, you know, I worked for you. I never ate, even ate any of the flock. And he said in verse 39, That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. The torn of beasts is the ones that were torn up by wild beasts. But any of them that was torn up by wild beasts, Jacob took the loss of those. And if it happened in the night or in the day, Jacob took all responsibility for those. Just like we need to take all responsibility for what we do with no excuses or with what we allow to happen. In verse 40, Thus I was in the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from mine eyes. 
When Jacob worked for Laban, he did it when he was really hot and the drought consumed him. He worked hard when it was really cold at night and even lost sleep over the job. Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I served thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle. And thou hast changed my wages ten times. You see, Jacob, all this time, he worked, he occupied till it was time to go home. <coughs> he served seven years for Rachel. Laban deceived him and gave him Leah. And this caused him to have to work seven more years for Rachel. So that's 14 years just working for his daughters, the daughters that Laban sold, sold his own daughters. Then Laban talked him into staying more years, and he worked six more for all the ring-straked, spotted, and speckled cattle. And through all this, he changed Jacob's wages ten times. It says in verse 42, Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hadst sent me away now empty. God hath, set, hath seen mine affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. So if it wasn't for God, Jacob would have nothing. Laban would have used him and sent him away without his wives, without his sons, without his cattle, or any possessions that he had picked up along the way. If it wasn't for God, then the devil would have kicked us to the pit empty-handed long ago. It's all because of God that we have anything. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters, or unto their children, which they have borne? A lot of what Laban is saying is half the truths and outright lies. Uh, Jacob married his daughters. Uh, they're no longer under his care. They're under Jacob's care. They're Jacob's now. They're Jacob's wives now. Not only that, but they were sold to Jacob like slaves. And those 11 boys and one daughter are Laban's grandchildren, but they are Jacob's children. They are his. Well, Laban can't say that they're his. The cattle's not Laban's cattle. Laban agreed to give Jacob all the ring streak, spotted, and speckled cattle as his wages. And he's just making it seem like he's doing Jacob this big favor by letting him have all of that cattle, his wives and his own children. This guy is a master deceiving manipulator. He is a narcissist, and he's even more of a deceiver than Jacob was. But the next thing is don't don't make an agreement I mean, don't make an agreement with the world, but make an agreement with yourself to never go back to the world. In Genesis thirty one forty four it says, Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, between Jacob and Laban, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. Jacob's about to make a covenant or agreement with Laban. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made in heap, and they did eat there upon the heap. The stone is going to be for a memorial of the covenant. And any time someone sees it, they're going to remember the covenant between Jacob and Laban. And Laban called it Jigar Sehadutha. But Jacob called it Galeed. And Jehar, Jagar Sehadutha means heap of testimony. Galid means heap of testimony or heap of witness. So Jacob's a more common man. It's the same thing. It's just Jacob said a much easier word. Laban tries to sound more professional, I guess. And Laban said this heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Notice how the Bible defines its terms so quickly. It said, this heap, this heap is a witness, showing you that that's what those two words meant there. And Mizpah, for he said, the Lord watch between me and thee, when we are absent one from another. So, even when Laban and Jacob are away from each other, the God of all the earth sees all and will be a witness that they keep the agreement. And what if you lived your life that way? What if you said the Lord 
watch between me and thee. The Lord watch what I'm doing. What if you could take a man at his word because you knew that that man feared God and wouldn't break a covenant, wouldn't break the covenant with you because he would be doing it in the eyes of God even if you weren't around to see it? What if people were that trustworthy and feared God that much? And it says, If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, <coughs> no one is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. Laban wasn't against him having multiple wives, but he was against him having other wives that didn't come from him. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar, which I have cast betwixt me and thee, this heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. So they make an agreement to basically stay away from each other in the sense that, you know, don't cross this thing for harm. If you got the intentions to come over this to harm me, then you stay on the other side. Don't pretty much just stay away from each other because t they can't get along anyway. And Laban, there's no telling what he's going to do. There's no telling what Jacob might do. He's a deceiver as well. But you need to make an agreement yourself to stay away from the world. You can't go out of the world, but you can be in it and not participate in the sins of it. Make an agreement with yourself not to go back to the world because it will be for harm. If you go back over to that other side you were on, it will be for harm. It will harm you. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us, and Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac. The fear of his father Isaac, I forgot to say before, the fear of his father Isaac is the Lord himself because that is who Jacob, that is who Isaac feared. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread and they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. And early in the morning Laban rose up and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them and Laban departed and returned unto his place. So it was settled. Jacob was free from Laban and not going to see each other no more.